In my third example of a Fourier transform calculation, I'm going to look at another piecewise function, but this time not with a constant or a linear part, but a piecewise function for which part is defined as an exponential. I've shown it here, e to the negative kt for positive or zero t, and zero along the negative t axis. k is just a constant. We might have something more to say about it after we've done the calculation. Let's draw the graph. It looks like this. The exponential approaches the t-axis asymptotically for large positive t. To the left of the f of t-axis, the function is just zero. In drawing it this way, I've assumed that k is a positive quantity. That assumption will be justified as we carry out the calculation. Let's write down the Fourier transform for this function. Here's the usual definition, and then we need to substitute f of t, remembering that the integral will now start at zero and progress to infinity. The integrand we get is a product of exponentials, one a real one, and the other an imaginary one. Well, actually, strictly speaking, complex. Once again, though, the presence of the j doesn't really affect the way we do the integral. We simply combine the exponentials using the sum of powers law satisfied by exponential functions. Then we have a single exponential which we can integrate immediately. There it is before the integration, and then in doing the integration we will get the same exponential divided by the constant coefficient of t, which happens to be a complex number. For convenience I've taken the minus that was originally down in the denominator on the k and the j omega up to the numerator and written minus 1 there. Clearly, substitution of the lower limit, t equals zero, will be easy. Let's just remind ourselves what we really mean by having infinity as the top limit on an integration. Infinity is not really a number, so what we mean here is that we have to think of the effect of letting t get bigger and bigger on the function. In fact, take the limit as t approaches infinity. Technically, we would write it this way. From a technical point of view, it is really more meaningful to put the top limit to be a number, n, and then consider what happens as n approaches infinity. Notice that I've also taken the liberty of breaking the exponentials up again. That will be important when we do the substitutions. Let's do those now. The coefficient at the front remains the same, and I still will need to take the limit as n goes to infinity. But now I'm going to substitute the top and bottom limits, naught and n, in the usual way. e to the zero, of course, is one, so the bottom limit is easy. Now look what happens when we let n get large. It's crucial, of course, that k has to be positive, so that that exponential, e to the minus kn, must detend to zero as n gets big. In that case, the whole term there just disappears for large n, and so we can eliminate it. I'll just pause for a moment so you can think about that. Once we accept that that term disappears, then we've just about completed the Fourier transform. We have a negative 1 that's still left, that's not affected by the limit as n goes to infinity. There's also a negative at the front, so we'll get just 1 over k plus j omega. That's a perfectly respectable answer, but it's not in the best form. Normally, we don't like complex numbers in a denominator, so we should multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate to get a complex number that we recognize. Once we've done that, the denominator will simply expand out to give us k squared plus omega squared, a real positive quantity. That's the best form to present the Fourier transform. And notice that I've also mentioned, just as a reminder, that k is positive. As Fourier transforms go, this is a relatively simple one, but it's interesting to note that it turns out to be a very important one. It appears, for example, in quantum field theory, in the study of certain kinds of particle. I'll leave you to investigate that if you're interested.